Hello and welcome. This is a very big year for India from the perspective of foreign affairs. This is the year of the Indian G20 presidency. And to get a sense of how the world outside views India at this moment in the context of the G20 presidency and also in the context of all the global geopolitical and geoeconomic trends that are playing themselves out. I've got a crack panel here at the World Economic Forum at Davos. Let me introduce first Gideon Rahman, uh, Chief Foreign Affairs Editor of the Financial Times. Welcome Ishan Tharoor from the Washington Post making his debut on India today. It's great to have you with us. One of the sharpest foreign policy wonks in India. Uh, we've got Samir Saran with us from the Observer Research Foundation, one of the most respected economic pundits in the world, Martin Wolf from the Financial Times. So thank you very much for taking our time. I want to start by focusing on that one big story that's playing itself out, the reopening of China. And we're seeing because of the fact that China has suddenly reopened its economy, uh, commodity prices are booming, the Chinese economy seems to be on an uptake. I want to start by asking Martin Wolf whether you think that this is temporary uh, just because they've opened up after being shut for so long and given how COVID is spreading uh, across mainland China, how do you see things in China this morning? Well, one thing I've learned in the last uh, year or so about China, let in mind the world is forecasting is a mugs game, but uh, I find it very difficult to believe that they're going to reverse what they've now done. I mean, it's been an extraordinary mess, let's be clear, but they're not going to reverse it. And I think they think that the pattern will follow a little bit what happened with India with Omicron, which is there is going to be a huge wave. They're not really going to count how many people died. And two or three months from now, everybody who could have it will have had it. And then they will be in a... Uh, a herd immunity post-COVID situation and the economy will expand. I think, I guess, I'm not sure, that the biggest reason they did this is the economy was really in terrible trouble. And for the Communist Party of China, uh, the economy is number one. I think it's the most important issue. And I, that then links to your other point. Yes, I think this will have a big effect on the Chinese economy and a big effect on the world economy when it reopens for the first time, after all, for three years. Gideon Rahman, Xi Jinping had to encounter protests of a kind that the Chinese state hadn't seen, not since Tiananmen. Some argue that the protests were even bigger than Tiananmen. Is he fully in control once again? Has he quelled the internal turmoil? There's no way of knowing for certain, but what's your best guess? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, Martin said it was the economy that triggered it to, to me. I mean, obviously, sitting outside China, I thought it was the demonstrations as much as that, that she panicked and he reacted very quickly. But, uh, you know, the demonstrations did then quell and China does have enormous repressive apparatus, which they could have rolled out. So their next question is whether Xi's prestige has been damaged by this very rapid about turn. What's your sense? To what extent has his prestige as the supreme leader, the greatest Chinese president of all time, how badly has that been hurt? Look, I think it has to be, but obviously it's a steeply controlled media environment. There's some discussion on the internet, even that can be managed a little bit. Uh, but the question, and the one we really can't answer, is internally in the Communist Party. But on the other hand, if you look at the objective situation, he's, he's just been confirmed for another five years, you know, potentially for life. So... I think he's still in control, even though it looks like a bit of a mess. Samir sir, and oftentimes autocrats, when they're in trouble domestically, create national security diversions to try and divert the attention of their local population. Is that a concern for India, given that this is the year of the G20? She could potentially be coming to India in September, but you've got very recently the Indian Army and the PLA square off in Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh. Look, Rahul, because she plans to come, I am worried. Every time he came, he has brought his army with him. So if you look back in history, uh, uh, you know, he, he visits India and you have an action on the borders. And this is not once, this is twice. Sure. Right? So coming to India should be, anyways, we should be on our guard because he doesn't come alone. Xi Jinping has a, has a habit of uh, bringing uh, trouble with him. And um, uh, I, I, we should be, um, a, you know, on, on alert. But, you know, on, on the point that Martin and, and Gideon raised, I think with China, one thing we should have learned by now, I'm not sure we have, but we should all try and imbibe it, that with China, first verify, then trust. Uh, I think the, the notion is, is absolutely on its head. Uh, don't believe any news that comes out of China, even if it is on Western liberal media. Right? I think that is the first precaution we all need to take. Uh, they know how to ride the, you know, borrow the boat to cross the seas. And right now, most media in the Western world is compromised. 
I'm not saying ours is not, but at least we are aware of ours being compromised. There, there is a, 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 a virtuous um, a belief that somehow uh, the Chinese are, are, are not riding their ship. So I do not believe any news I read coming out of anywhere other than what we hear from folks in that country and in that city and certainly from our folks who are present there. That's the first part. The second, I think, the news is not Chinese rebound or Chinese virus. The news is that China, more people will die than who will be born this year. And I think that is the inflection point. China is becoming a smaller country and therefore is now going to face new headwinds that they have not experienced before. You are deriding the Western media, Ishan. No, I am not deriding the Western media. I am appraising them in the right manner. Okay, Ishan, there is a lot of commentary about uh, Xi moderating his positions on wolf warrior diplomacy, on opening up because of the manner in which China saw protests. The counter to that, the likes of Samir would say that this is just very temporary and only because of the protests and only because of the virus. Are you seeing a moderation or do you think this is just a pragmatic she cutting his losses just in this moment and he will be back to wolf warrior diplomacy the moment he's got COVID under control? Well, I, I think certainly the imperatives of, that, that come with opening up the economy and, and projecting a new China post-pandemic uh, on the world stage means a recalibration. And during the pandemic, uh, we saw a hardening of positions both in China, but obviously also certainly in the United States. And what's really struck me here uh, in Davos is the gap between the Washington conversation on China and the Davos conversation on China. You know, here we're talking about uh, the boon to the global economy. We're talking about uh, prospects for 2023 where India is leading the G20 and where we're going to see uh, new forms of regional collaboration and, and evolution. Um, Whereas in the U.S., uh, the view on China remains incredibly hard, hawkish as a bipartisan consensus in Washington uh, that is uninterested in any narrative about China opening up to the world. And uh, whatever pivots and recalibrations you're seeing from Xi, I know there was a productive meeting between uh, the Americans and Chinese not long ago. You're going to see uh, a visit from Blinken to China uh, soon. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think... Uh, it's very hard to really uh, give the Chinese that much credit when we've seen such a tremendous geopolitical polarization uh, unfurl. Uh, when an American delegation visited Taiwan, Gideon, we saw uh, the PLN enforce a very strict naval blockade of the Taiwan Straits. There's been a lot of talk about whether she intends to make a go for Taiwan in this presidency or whether COVID and the slowdown has pushed any Chinese plans to take over Taiwan out into an indefinite future. What's your sense? Look, I don't think anybody really knows. What you can see is that China has given itself increased military capacity so that they can give themselves an option, they think, to possibly invade Taiwan. You can look at Xi's rhetoric, which has been ramped it up a bit and said, you know, we can't leave this for further generations. But for the rest, I think it's partly speculation. If you talk to kind of Western analysts who get, you know, privileged information, even they don't really know. But I don't think that the consensus is he's going to do it this year. People talk maybe three to five years. But I think the, the fundamental uncertainty is that it's a very authoritarian system. In the end, it's Xi's call. Uh, you know, as one Western analyst put it to me, even the most senior Chinese we speak to are just messengers to Xi, and Xi makes the decision. And as we've just seen with COVID, he can change his mind pretty quickly. Martin, how do you see the Chinese economic story play out from here? It's been the most formidable story in the past three decades and more. Now, though, post the pandemic, growth uh, much slower than in the past. Many say the idea of the Chinese economy overtaking America may actually never pan out. Uh, are the best days of the Chinese economy behind it or still to come? Well, um, I should say one thing about this conversation so far, which is that India's G20 presidency is a poisoned chalice and nothing can be expected of it because it's a, not because of India's fault, but because the major players disagree so profoundly on everything, including the time of day, as it were, um, uh, uh, as we've heard. And... Uh, now, I think that uh, I recognize that I don't understand the security side of China, but I followed the economy for 30 years really quite closely. And I think I do have a reasonable understanding of the economy. Uh, so the difficulties they are in are structural and deep. And they reflect, uh, in part, the demographic problem, though I think that is exaggerated. We can discuss it in detail. But, it, but the, the growth model they have had has 
which has been a catch-up growth model based on staggeringly high investment rates uh, and uh, has really run out of uh, room. The return on investment has fallen very, very sharply over a decade. This is not new. They kept it going with massive infusions of debt. It's one of the most highly indebted countries in the world. It is increasingly being cut off from important technologies uh, from the rest of the world because of U.S. paranoia. And... Uh, and the, uh, the general tone of, of China vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is seen as increasingly hostile, which makes people very nervous about deepening their connection to them, including in East Asia, including very important countries in East Asia, important partners. All this suggests to me that Chinese growth will be, they will be lucky to do better than 3% or so over the next decade, 3, 3 3.5%. That's still probably faster than the US, so I think growth will catch up, will continue to occur, but the sort of growth we saw in China up to the financial crisis, up to 2012 actually, is not going to To recur. what extent do you think, Martin, India is poised to benefit from China's troubles? India is trying very hard through production-linked incentives, through the idea of an Atmanirbhar self-reliant India to attract uh, international MNCs as they look to di diversify their supply chains out of China, partly. Do you think India could be the one big beneficiary or would benefits get split amongst various countries? My view is... One, that India really should grow faster than China significantly over the next decade or two. All the potential is there. And two, there is a potential here, but I believe that Indian policy will have to change a lot and Indian attitudes will have to change what, a lot. Well, essentially what China did to become China was take some really very radical steps in 30, 20 years ago. What would you like to say? Um, open up the economy, open it to trade, invest massively, just gigantically in trade-oriented orient infrastructure, provide a very, very comfortable home for MNCs like Apple and so forth to make it the main production base, welcome them, have the most efficient, incredibly efficient support for them. Uh, it was, and of course this was helped greatly by the immense influence of the overseas Chinese in this e economy. This required a wholehearted discipline which was a strange combination of bureaucratic centralization with very careful but enormous openness. So, yeah. I don't think from my following India over the last half century, that India really wants to do that. And I'm not sure that even if it wanted to do it, it can. But it, can, it will be a beneficiary. There's no doubt. But you ask, will it be the main beneficiary? I'm not convinced. So, means you understand the mind of the Modi government well. Uh, there is the reality of an impending general election next year. The fact also that whenever the government has tried to push through tough reform on farm, on land, there's been a big political pushback and out on the streets as well. Do you see the government push ahead with tough economic measures given that we're building into an election year? So uh, I think Rahul, uh, let me respond to this in two ways. One, taking something that Martin mentioned, which is, which is fairly accurate. He says that India is unlikely to be uh, or offer what the Chinese offered when they were um, you know, really opening up and growing. I don't think India, India is ever going to adopt the Chinese model. It can't, uh, simply because of the very different society, community, and country that we are. And we shouldn't. Uh, that's the first point. But I don't believe that that is the only template or the one that uh, mercantilist America followed uh, 100 years ago. I think there is an India way. Uh, uh, and perhaps when we are sitting here 10 years from now, uh, we might have discovered it. And I, could, I can see some elements of it um, uh, unfold, even as we said today, which is um, a sectoral openness. So we'll pick our sectors where we want to engage. So, for example, laying the red carpet out for Apple or, you know, responding to energy, uh, electronic insecurity, diversifying the energy basket, going green, not because uh, of, of, of the noise coming from Europe, but because it helps in our energy security uh, uh, program. So you will see an India model which will have a degree of openness, a degree of protection for communities. Uh, that's a responsibility. So even as we move to, just so that all of us know, even as we move to uh, a $10 trillion economy, in say a decade or more, uh, we would still be $6,000 per capita income. So there would be a role of the state to protect those who are in the margins. So we are never going to open up our uh, vulnerable folks to the market forces because, you know, never trust a benevolent politician and a benevolent market. Both of them don't exist. So we will have to have a mix of both. And that is going to be the India model. But we are going to do something different. 
we are the first economy that is really going to change the nature of who we are in the digital age. Now, the digital age lends itself a very different um, uh, landscape of possibilities. And India ex is experimenting with that. India has unleashed the entrepreneur, um, um, entrepreneurship of uh, small towns, peri-urban centers, agri-retail, uh, and folks under 25, uh, to the extent no other country has before. Now, India is going to be a largely digital story, enabled by the digitalization, by big data availability, by creating solutions uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure that does not exist, uh, using digital means. Uh, you, know, you know, so I feel that we don't know the India way. I don't think India has fully created a blueprint for where it wants to go. But like everything in India, it is going to be based on massive community participation in its transformation. It is, it is going to be based on strong governments in certain sectors, uh, openness in other sectors, and it is going to be based on, uh, of course, the role of the diaspora or the Chinese. I think that is the common story. We are continuing to see increasing interest by overseas Indians in the India story, uh, sometimes meddlesome, but, but uh, mostly positive. A lot of what happens across the world this year depends on the outcome and the future cost of the war between Ukraine and Russia, Ishan Tarul. Your sense of where this battle, the war goes from here, we're seeing uh, the war continue month after month with no immediate sign of uh, closure. Is that the way it's likely to stay through the year? All signs indicate yes. And, you know, talking about what India does but as, a, as the head of the G20 this year, um, if you talk to the Indonesians, the war in Ukraine really upset the apple cart for them in terms of their ambitions for the G20 presidency. This is, as you said, a war that has consumed the Western imagination uh, for obviously understandable reasons in many cases. Uh, but it, when, it, when it comes to India's interests, and when it comes to the interests of a country like Indonesia, uh, where when they took the mantle of the G20, this was a moment for them to, to really assert themselves on the world stage in a certain way. This is a, a multicultural Southeast Asian democracy that has a view of the world that they thought they could bring to bear. And it was completely swept aside uh, by the, the polarization created by the war in Ukraine. And, you know, that very well may be the case as we watch India take the mantle of G20 leadership. It's not clear uh, what conditions could arise at this point uh, that could lead to a meaningful process of political settlement. And it's not clear where the political will is to push those conditions. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, you saw the Indonesians try to broker something that wasn't particularly meaningful. I doubt that India has any further capacity as well to play a major role on this in the global context. So this is a war that will continue to create ruptures, uh, that will continue to drain economies, and that the U.S. will probably continue to bankroll uh, in years, in months to come. Gideon, you, we're also seeing NATO countries arm Ukraine with the kind of weapon systems they earlier said were off the table. To what extent does that increase the prospect of uh, NATO getting further dragged into this war? Do you agree with Ishan where he says it will continue in the same vein? Could it get much worse before it gets better? Well, I mean, I think you're right. There's been a gradual shift. And I think that at the beginning, the NATO countries, and particularly the US, were very conscious of the risk of nuclear war, frankly. They were very worried that Putin would use a nuclear weapon. And they restrained and what kind of stuff they were giving. Now you're seeing the British, for example, giving challenger tanks to the, to, to the Ukrainians and hoping that the Germans, who have actually many more attacks, these leopards, will follow up. And I think uh, it's not that there's no longer concern about Russian escalation, but less. And I, I tend to agree with Ishan that, that it looks like a kind of stalemate and a deadlock, but the, if you talk to some of the Western folk about, well, what is their game plan? Their view is that if the Ukrainians can make rapid gains with some of this new equipment in the spring, that maybe you can get it to the point where Putin does decide there has to be peace talks. That won't be easy for either side because the Ukrainians will want to push on to Crimea. I don't think actually the West would back them in that. They'd put the pressure on them behind the scenes. But whether, you it know, could also lead to an under pressure Putin wanting to escalate. Further. Well, exactly. And, and again, I think there's a slight division of opinion. I think the Americans are a bit more cautious than the Europeans, actually. Uh, but the Americans provide all the money and all the weapons, not all of it, but the bulk of it. So even if the Europeans are saying to the Americans behind the scenes, you know, come on, guys, you can be a bit harder. It's actually the caution in the White House, which is setting the, the tone. Martin Wolf. The big fear in Europe in the winter was that there'd be a massive energy crisis, partly because it wasn't quite as cold uh, as it usually is, 
uh, and also because of uh, Europe's <laughs> At I'm this moment, <laughs> at this moment, it is, and also because of Europe's very quick pivot towards renewables uh, and uh, just energy diversification, do you think Europe's been able to get past their dependence on Russia? I think, at the moment, this winter has gone amazingly well. I mean, it's just amazing. The second point I would make is this reminds me of something I've believed ever since the 70s, which is if you really change incentives, it's amazing how well market economies can adjust. And what's gone on in German industry is very, very impressive. And the third is, let's see what happens next winter. Because uh, there is a, you know, gas is still important. Uh, th there is a question of whether they will be able to fill up uh, the tanks as it were, the storage over the summer as well as they did last summer when Putin was still pumping. And if they don't, what next winter will be like? I think people are still cautious about that. But I would have to say right now, things look a bit better than they did a few months ago. So, I mean, India has been able to maneuver quite smartly, continuing to increase import of Russian oil and yet somehow not run into trouble with Washington or at least run into trouble but just through words but not in any meaningful fashion. Uh, how do you see the Russia-Ukraine war panning out from an Indian perspective? So, so let me respond to something Martin said earlier. I think uh, G20 is not easy at this moment. The Indonesians found out and uh, uh, that is a fact. Uh, but also, if there was one G20 country that you wanted to be running the G20 at this time, it is likely to be India. So the good news is that you might see the G20 tied over another year simply because you have a country like India at the helm who can both talk to Putin and Washington and, and have a common sense outcome that uh, takes the G20 agenda forward. So in many ways, uh, while it may be a, a defensive G20, this also might set the architecture for a world of the future where polarizations are going to make bodies like this work on uh, uh, some basic common agenda uh, points. And, and What do you and, think and can fight. be India's legacy at the G20? Well, I think there could be three legacies. One, to make sure it didn't end here. That is the first legacy, that, that it did not end uh, in New Delhi. That is the first legacy. Second, that it takes forward certain common propositions for humankind forward, which is green transitions, which is the development agenda, uh, which is looking at uh, sustainability from a wider lens uh, than just uh, what is spoken about here or in other parts of Europe. Uh, that's the second legacy. And the third, and I think this is important, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the reform of multilateral systems, and I think that's important, whether it's the, the Bretton Woods, or whether it is how we respond to crises themselves, such as the peace and... The UN is defunct when it comes to peace and security agenda. That pillar is not working in the UN because of the veto system and because of the polarization in the Security Council. That is, uh, uh, that is a lame duck arrangement. So I think it is these informal groupings that will emerge during this G20 presidency, how various countries will be talking to each other to have some sort of an outcome, may give you the format of a networked multilateral architecture uh, where, uh, where hubs of conversations intersect and create common outcomes. I think that could be the third legacy. Uh, smart multilateralism in, a, in the network age. But let me just respond to one more point. I think on, on India has played it smartly. No, India has not played it smartly. India has done what it needs to do for its 1.4 billion people. We were not playing games here. We are not the aggressor. We are not part of the conflict. Um, uh, we've seen countries come into our uh, traditional energy zones and, and start buying from them. We saw, look, because we are buying from Russia, the energy spikes are not that severe. If we, if we were hunting in the same uh, pools of oil in the Middle East, uh, you would see a much sharper rise. We are actually easing the pressure on many others by being able to do this and they don't have to take the guilt on their conscience. So in a sense, we are the relief mechanism for the, for, for the virtuosity of the Europeans and Americans which would have been shattered had we not been doing this. The, look, who's off-taking the refined products? India is not buying their own refined products. It's because it's coming from India, Europe and America are busy buying it. So, so, so the fact here is India is doing what it needed so to do. So you're saying for. Russian oil is getting to Europe but be, after being refined uh, in uh, Europe? Uh, you in, know, in, in I, I'm not doing carbon tracing of each of it. Yeah. But the fact is when you have X amount of oil in the market yeah. and, and the bulk of it is going to the developed world, uh, guess, guess what is happening here? Yeah. Right. So uh, I, I'm not tracking each uh, barrel and how it is being produced, but I'm just saying that if if the majority of refined products are going to a certain geography, then it is fair to assume that we have eased the energy pressures 
on 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 those who consume energy and 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 it's and it's not difficult to do the maths here ishan what's the outlook in washington when it comes to india's g20 presidency given that the world seems to be what wef is calling in a state of poly crisis multiple crises playing out simultaneously I'll be completely frank with you and say that Washington doesn't have much of an outlook on India's G20 presidency. Uh, the war in Ukraine has really gal- returned us to uh, a kind of Cold War moment in the city where you have uh, a bipartisan embrace of this conflict to a certain extent, uh, of a kind of American role in the world that harkens back to a different era of military intervention and conflict. Um, if there is a significant conversation in Washington about China, it is also a security conversation uh, linked to Taiwan, which has obviously been uh, escalated as a conversation because of the Ukraine war. Uh, and I, I don't think, you know, when, when we, we hear Samir talking about uh, multipolarities and, and the new architectures emerging, uh, that is not something on American radars. And that's probably for the detriment of the U.S. I think there's, there are huge gaps in the way Americans see the world, uh, not least uh, their lack of recognition of the importance of what, you know, in decades to come, the Chinese middle class market, the market represented by the Indian middle class, I mean, the, the tremendous weight they will have on the global system. No one in America is thinking about that right now. In the few minutes that I have before I wrap up, I want to ask Gideon about this piece that you wrote where you actually suggest that Biden could go down in American history as one of the country's greatest presidents ever. Now, when you see Biden talk, walk, move, that's not really the perception somebody picks up. So argue your case out and then we'll get a counter. Sure. I mean, he doesn't. He's not a vigorous guy. And uh, all of us are worried about somebody running for a re-election at 82. But if you look at what he's achieved in domestic terms, he's passed a massive stimulus, massive sort of green energy stuff. He's got a lot more through Congress, actually, than Obama did. Um, and internationally, it was looking terrible for him at the beginning of this year because of Afghanistan. But the way that Ukraine has turned out so far... Actually, America has rallied America's allies in Europe, in Asia, and it's done it through quite astute diplomacy. And this looks like it could end with a major setback for Russia and with China looking a bit more cautiously at the world. So if that is his legacy, and I think he sees his legacy as supporting democracy at home and abroad. And you've got to remember, he took power just after the storming of Congress in January the 6th. We were all wondering whether American democracy was permanently destabilized. If he can stabilize the United States and reassert democratic values overseas. And I think that is the kind of big picture that's emerging. Well, it's, that's a great president. Martin, do you agree with your colleague's assessment that he could go down in history as one of America's greatest presidents ever? Well, greatest pre- um, president ever. There have been so many bad ones. It's not such a, it's not such a difficult uh, challenge, actually. Um, he has been certainly more successful in the last two years than I expected. Uh, I would add, he beat Trump, even though Trump has never admitted it, uh, and uh, the midterms were a remarkable success from his point of view. I mean, he had the, they had the, the smallest swing against them, I think, of any party for, what, 40 years, 50 years? Uh, Gideon would know exactly. So, politically, he has been incredibly successful, much more successful than anybody would have imagined. And internationally, I think he's actually had a bit of luck because, well, actually, I'm rather frightened with where the U.S. The U.S. is a Manichaean power, and it really likes enemies, and they've got them. Two great big juicy ones together. And Biden has responded to that far better than Trump would ever have done, or Obama for that matter. So that he's got luck too. So I think it's a reasonable chance that his presidency, reasonable, will go down as really rather surprisingly successful. Ishan, you're looking forward to the prospect of an 82-year-old seeking re-election? Well, you know, a a week in Washington is a year, so we're still further away from that. But... uh, Absolutely, the way Biden has galvanized uh, the transatlantic alliance, every European diplomat you talk to in Washington has been thrilled with the way he's conducted himself and managed the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, going forward, you know, we're one election away, cycle away from another return to the conversations about the threats facing American democracy, the polarization in the country, the advance of uh, various far-right forces that are reshaping at least one wing of American politics. And that is all with us still. So uh, while we can praise Biden for achieving some genuinely substantive things, uh, America is not out of the woods yet in terms of its political forecast. 
while Biden's trying to set the American house in order, a person of Indian origin seems to be setting Britain in order at last. Gideon Rachman, what do you think about Rishi Sunak? A lot of interest back home. In what He's not really of Indian origin directly, just yeah. very distantly, but the Indians love him and they say, okay, here's a brown man, he's showing the Brits how to run their country in an orderly fashion. Yeah, well, we, see, we think of him as British, so we don't think of he's showing the Brits how to do this. Um, but yeah, I think he's, he's got off to... Look, there are two things. His political situation is terrible in the sense the Tories are way behind. He'll probably lose the next election unless he's a miraculously successful prime minister. But if you talk to, like, the civil servants who'd have to try and make the government run, they are immensely relieved to have him in, in control after the chaos of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, simply for basic things, like he starts meetings on time, he ends them on time, he's read the, he's read the papers, he asks intelligent questions, and he makes a decision. And that should be, like, taken as read, but believe me, it wasn't in Britain. So that's, that's an advance. What do you think of how uh, Rishi is doing? I would emphasize, I mean, because this surprises me so much, but if you look at this conservative government, this really is multiracial. I mean, it's been a complete transformation. I think we should get over this sort of question. Britain has become a quite a different country. I mean, it's, it's not that it's Sajid Javid and uh, Zawari and so, on, so many of them. Suella uh, Braverman and Kemi Ba. But uh, the, much more so, actually, than Labour. I think this is fascinating, but it's, you can see it in the city. You, you, can, see in bin, you can see it in the city. Now, on Richie, my view, uh, met him and talked to him, he's sane. He's reasonably well informed and he works hard. And this is wonderful. A great relief from his two predecessors. In fact, most, unfortunately, at the moment, I don't think we'll see that he's a great politician. And politics, as you know, with somebody like Modi, well, worries me often, but politics is something else. You have to tell a story to the public that they will buy. Uh, and Boris was good at that. He was bad at everything else, but he was good at that. I'm not clear that Richie Sunak can do that. And that means he can be competent, which is wonderful, but he can't be transformative, and I'm not sure he will last. Oh, you do because think I, you think, I think the overwhelming probability is the British public will say, we've had 13 or 14 years of these people, they've made a terrible mess of it, and they have, and we want, the, and we want them gone. Ishan, now that's interesting. Indians laying distant claim to Rishi Sunak. The British saying, hey, he's as British as British gets. Not really, but he's British enough for us to, be, uh, to have him as Prime Minister. How are you seeing the Sunak Prime Ministership play out? You know, I think there was, when he, when he, through the machinations of the Tory party, came to power, I think there was a lot of hyperbole about how he's the British Obama. You know, this kind of big win for an identitarian uh, view of things. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm quite pleased by the fact that, at least in the British conversation, viewing it from afar, uh, the identity politics dimension of this has not mattered very much. And it doesn't matter very much. And what's much more present is the class understanding of, of, of where he's from, his privilege, his, his career as a, as a hedge fund and uh, hedge fund guy and financier, uh, and how that has so much more to bear on the political conversation than, you know, where his parents come from, where his grandparents came from. I think I, it's, 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 it's something you see in the U.S. as well. There is tremendous excitement in India about certain Indian American origin politicians. But I don't think if you talk to a lot of the Indian American origin politicians there as well, uh, they feel the weight of their culture or cultural background as heavily as it's viewed in India. So one very quick final question from all our guests. I'll start from here. What's it that worries you the most this year? God, there's a lot to worry about. But uh, I think the Ukraine war, I mean, it could go wrong in many, many ways. And it's going wrong every day because there's sort of brutality being committed on the ground. And there's tragic stuff still happening there, and it could get worse. Sami, the one unknown that worries you the most? Well, indirectly the Ukraine war, but directly it's the apathy of uh, those busy with uh, conducting the war on some of the more important matters that we are confronted with, climate change and development. And I think indirectly it means that they are so preoccupied that they do not realize that the greater, bot greater battle is happening somewhere else. Isha? I would say this is maybe a cop-out. I would say just the steady advance of climate change. Every year we're seeing devastating new uh, effects of a warming planet, and I think it's only going to get worse. And even in the United States, it's really testing the uh, sort of badly, uh, badly uh, repaired infrastructure that exists already. So I would worry more about um, the, the horrors that we're going to see caused by the, a warming planet. Sabul? Both. Short term... An era of war is an era of massive unpredictability and 
it can go anywhere. I think it's a low chance it ends the world, but it could. Yeah, it could. They've got, they've got two powers here with 10,000 nuclear warheads between them. This isn't a joke. Uh, and the second point is this. In the long term, climate, development, sustainability is the core challenge of our generation. The world is caught at this moment in a hot war that doesn't seem to be getting over and a cold war that's just beginning to take shape, which could set the tone for the next several decades. We've had a very sharp and incisive conversation with some very astute minds. Now, thank you all for joining me in this freezing weather here in Davos. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.